Oh, hello. My New Year's resolution for 22 is to design something these lakes have never before seen in. Well, time must have gotten away from me. How do you do, everyone? And uh, what do you think of what you're sitting on? This ship, the Columbia, is one of my more popular, at least for these purposes. Uh, certainly my most popular of the Bablo boats these days. Is it my imagination, or do I see some familiar faces out there? No? Oh. <laughs> well, it must be all this fresh air getting to me. I've been spending a lot of time indoors with little company but my pencils and drafting table, but <sighs> standing up here on the bow of a ship, it does give one a certain perspective. I should probably introduce myself. Forgive me. My name is Frank Kirby. I design boats. The one we're floating on now, the Columbia, is 207 feet long with a breadth of 60 feet. With its multiple levels, we get 27,000 square feet of wood riveted to a steel hull. I designed it to fit 3,200 passengers and <laughs> quite a bit more in truth, but let's not tell the harbor master. Hmm? <laughs> Built in 1902, it's a propeller boat with a 1,200 horsepower triple expansion reciprocating steam engine. Now, I'm rather proud of it, but I'm afraid I cannot take credit for the beautiful interiors you noticed. That honor belongs to my friend, the late Mr. Lewis O'Keel, his son Arthur, and their workshop of artists and artisans with whom I've had the pleasure of working with on many projects over some 30 years. But excuse me for a moment. I have... Yes, yes. Now, this wasn't my first Bablo boat, you know. We'd have to go all the way back to 1892 to the steamer, The Promise. I remember seeing her from time to time, usually filled to capacity. <laughs> Only 2,000 on that one, but it was more than a start. You know, as if that wonder wasn't enough, as if that distinction, excuse me, wasn't enough, that little wonder was also involved in the first successful marine radio experiment when... Ah! <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. I was told you came to hear about my life, my accomplishments, so perhaps I should start somewhat earlier. The beginning? The beginning. July 1st, 1849. I was the youngest of two sons born to Martha and Stephen Kirby in Dover County, Ohio, and my father was a shipbuilder and captain also. Now. Around the time I was born, cries of gold could be heard all the way from California. And my father, at the age of 25, outfit the Eureka for 59 passengers, from brig to bark, the largest sailing vessel on the Great Lakes and to which he was the sailing master for a first of its kind voyage, in which it sailed first to Quebec and then around the Cape Horn to California, making it the first lake ship to do so. so I guess you could say that daring the water was in my blood from the very beginning. Now, in 53, my father moved us from Ohio to East Saginaw, Michigan, at the behest of New York capitalist Jesse Hoyt. Now, Hoyt and his father were interesting fellows, visionaries, you might say. Saginaw wasn't much to look at in those days, but these men looked to the future, and they knew it was up to people to pave the path there. One of the first things Jesse did after arriving from New York was to build a plank, a plank road, excuse me, connecting Saginaw to Flint. And shortly thereafter, he would erect a grand hotel that would cause a short-sighted newspaperman to report that anyone who would build so fine a hotel in such a swampy little valley must be possessed of more money than brains. <laughs> As time has gone by and occasions have provided, I have been fortunate to escape such a distinction and the truth? Well, you're sitting on it. Now, as a child, I, I recall being especially tenacious when it came to watercraft, often sneaking down to the Detroit River docks, much against my father's wishes, to watch the boat races. Perhaps he wanted more for his life, for his son's life, than a life on the inland seas. Or more simply, he didn't want me to fall into the cut, but either way, I couldn't help my attraction. One race in particular stands out in my memory, when two exceptional steamers came through on their way from Port Huron to Amherstburg. I remember darting down the stairs from the deck of the ship I'd snuck onto, 
gaining more than a few splinters in the process and watching excitedly through a porthole as they raced by. <laughs> when I was still young, my father designed ships for the Union during that time of conflict, but the rest of our family remained here in Michigan. I was a teenager by this time, and Hoyt must have sensed an itching restlessness in me, so at his suggestion, I made my way to New York to study at Cooper Union. It was there, while obtaining my education, that things really began to pick up steam for me. No? Pick up steam? All right, well. Steam joke, not a success. Oh, anyway, my evenings were reserved for scholarship, of course, but my days were spent at the Allaire Ironworks, drafting engine plans and contributing to the war effort as best I could. As the work of my adolescence began finding its fulfillment in early adulthood, there was much I was still learning. I left Cooper Union, but I stayed in New York for about five years after the war. I was no longer a child and, well, I thought I'd found my purpose for the future. And besides, I was rather enjoying my time in the city, drafting at various ironworks. Now, New York City in that era was quite a bit different than it was today. For one thing, it was much smaller, this being before the boroughs consolidated. But Manhattan being an island on the Atlantic, it afforded me many opportunities to witness ongoing innovations with oceanic vessels whenever I could get away from my desk. As familiar as I was with their operations and builds, I was equally awed by their majesty and power. And perhaps not quite in the same way I had been as a child out of pure wonderment, but rather from a place of knowing respect. Then the momentous year of 1870 happened, and I, at the ripe old age of 21, discovered I was not as invincible as I had once believed. I traveled westward home to meet with a physician. Hoyt joined me on that journey, and on the last leg of the trip to East Saginaw, he introduced me to none other than Detroit's first millionaire, Captain Eber Brock Ward. Now, as one of the Midwest's first proper industrialists, Ward's interests included lumber, steel, and most importantly to me, shipbuilding. At the time, Ward's company was the largest shipbuilder on the Great Lakes. And not long after that initial meeting, he invited me to join his ironworks operation in Wyandotte. And my brother Fritz was hired as well. Now, Ward wasn't the only industrialist interested in shipbuilding, of course. I could tell you the long story of how the Campbell and Owen shipyard became the Detroit Dry Dock Company with my father and Mr. Owen as founders, but <laughs> I'll spare you the details. What's important for our discussion is that while I was studying in New York, my father was preparing for the future by buying into a shipyard. And Ward's capitalizing of myself and my brother would eventually put us in a position to seize upon that future. Now, in the years after the war, the nature of passenger travel was changing. People like my father saw this. Fewer and fewer were the people taking everything they owned westward, and more and more were the fares being paid by tourists and commuters. With these changing concerns, ships with different features were likely to do well, and it was looking like civilian ships would increasingly be made in metal. Uh, people like Captain Ward saw this, and he asked me to design and oversee their production. Pretty swell, huh? You ever have those moments you won't forget, those moments that seemingly change your life forever? Well, that train ride home was one such moment for me. While I'm sure I would have designed ships, no matter where I chose to make my home, Ward's offer to superintend his ironworks operation kept me from returning to New York City, and that, combined with my father buying into what would eventually become the Detroit Dry Dock Company, all but assured that my family would remain involved in the post-war era of shipbuilding in an impactful way. Now, Ward's shipyard in Wyandotte was the first in the region to specialize in building metal hulls. It was an era of experimentation for certain, and Fritz and I were part of it. Now, this ship, the Columbia, set sail in 1902 when I was already well established in my career. But back in 1892, excuse me, back in ah, 1872, that's when I first started getting notice for my work. Was it a marvelous passenger ship, you may ask? No. 
It was for something else entirely, an iron-hulled tugboat. The E.B. Ward Jr. was the boat that got me noticed because it outperformed expectations in important ways. It was a composite type ship, an internal structure of iron with wooden beams connected to the frame. Not the first, but nevertheless. Ward then, he then had us build the first vessel in North America made of Bessemer steel, the Sport, using uneven, leftover, rusty, 10-year-old experimental steel ingots from his Eureka Ironworks. We also built a small passenger steamer called the Queen of the Lakes. We were young, we were fast, and the sailing was smooth. Until it wasn't. The next few years brought, well, they brought a whirlwind of activity. 73 brought financial panic and affected the types of ships we'd be making. Uh, by 74, the Detroit Dry Dock Company had officially been incorporated through a merger of interest by my father and John Owen, and then Captain Ward, whilst walking the streets of Detroit, as he so often did, well, his heart simply gave out. His unexpected and sudden death in the middle of that decade allowed for his concerns in Wyandotte to be purchased. <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And so I decided to get married. <laughs> October 9th, 1876. Her name is Mary. <laughs> She's really quite something. I hope one day you have the chance to meet her. Now, as I was saying, the Detroit Dry Dock Company went on to absorb Ward's facilities in Wyandotte, and including the one I operated. And shortly thereafter, the DDD, that's Detroit Dry Dock, got a regular client in the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company, or D&C for short. James McMillan, a managing partner of both companies and a future U.S. Senator, built the relationship. The first ship I designed for his company was the City of Detroit, 234 feet long and made entirely of iron. <laughs> this was the first of, so far, 11 sidewheel steamers I designed for the DNC line. Now, for those of you who have sailed this route before, you know that to get to Bablo from Detroit doesn't take too long. But some people have told me on those magical evenings headed back home, they wish the journey could have taken a little bit longer. Now, I have to say that's a wonderful compliment. You know, when I'm designing a new ship, as I am right now, there is much to consider. And one of the main concerns is who will use the vessel? Yeah. You know, when I was designing this ship, the Columbia, I wanted her to stand apart from other steamers. And that is why she is the first of her kind to feature a full-size ballroom. <laughs> I wanted people to enjoy themselves on this little getaway, far from the responsibilities of everyday life. I wanted them to sail away for a day of relaxation. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, yes. I was living in Detroit at the time, and I had become the lead stockholder in many related businesses. Brass works, sheet metal, you name it. I won't belabor the point and bore you with the details, but. Most importantly, I had become the chief engineer and naval architect for the Detroit Dry Dock Company. Oh, I, I designed ships for many other companies during this time. White Star, Ashley and Dustin, the Cleveland and Buffalo line. But because of the James McMillan connection, I became the preferred architect for the DNC Transit Company and designed the vast majority of their ships during this time. My sidewheel steamers are said to be some of the most efficient and beautiful, elegant even. And I love these compliments. But most importantly, they're punctual. DNC had a tradition at the time of naming all of their ships after one of their ports of call. And based on the success of the city of Detroit, the city of Cleveland was commissioned to be an even grander ship. It was advertised as the fastest ship on the Great Lakes because of her speed of 20 miles per hour. Now, despite the naming convention being, shall we say, rather apparent, my ships do have a reputation for innovation. The city of Cleveland's speed was due to the fact that she was the first 
late going side wheeler to incorporate feathering into the design of her panels. Now, feathering was a vast improvement over the shipbuilding paddles co commonly used at the time. Uh, let me explain. Before feathering, when the paddles, commonly referred to as buckets, hit the water, they did so at an odd angle. This was inefficient. Feathering changed all that by improving the angle at which the paddles hit the water, thereby reducing stress on the machinery, allowing for greater thrust and therefore faster ships. I also came up with an idea to reduce the size of the paddles, which allowed them to turn faster and take up less space in the ship's design. Now, this speedy city of Cleveland was later renamed the city of Alpena after she was moved to a route from Detroit to Mackinac. And shortly thereafter, I delivered the city of Detroit II and the city of Cleveland III, which joined the first city of Detroit, now called the City of Lights. And ah, <laughs> I promise you don't have to keep all of these names straight. I barely can myself. The point is, all of these new commissions allowed DNC to fully modernize their fleet. When the company started a Cleveland, excuse me, when the company started, oh yes, the Detroit to Buffalo service, I sent them two ships, the Eastern States and the Western States. The Buffalo service proved immensely popular, and so, you guessed it, I sent them two more ships, the City of Cleveland three and the City of Detroit three. Followers of my work often debate which of these floating palaces best represent my work, but <laughs> I have to say that I think the one I'm dreaming up now will surpass them both for modernity. Now, size and speed, they're not the only areas for innovation in shipbuilding, of course. When the Mackinac Transportation Company needed a new ice-breaking ship because their fleet was continually being impeded by ice on the Straits of Mackinac, they asked the commander of their fleet, Commodore Lewis Boynton and myself, to craft a modern-day ice-breaking ship. Now, you may have heard of Captain Boynton. He was known as the hero of Alpina. You may have heard of him, how he saved the town one winter with his ingenuity, lashing two boats together and having one of them go in reverse to break through the ice and allow the town access to much needed supplies. In the 60s and 70s, the British and the Germans were both using a technology for icebreakers where the bow of the ship was specially crafted like a spoon so that the ship could rise up over the ice and crush it with the weight of the vessel. Boynton and I improved on this idea and made a few important additions. The idea we came up with for our ship, the St. Ignis, was unique. Propellers at both the bow and stern of the ship. The propeller at the bow created a stream under the ice, thereby weakening it and causing it to break. And we also added ballast pumps to rock the ship as an additional means to keep it moving through the ice. As I say, this technology was unique, but it didn't remain that way for long. It became widespread in Europe in the years that followed. Now, on a related note, uh, forgive me this digression, but I wanted to make mention of something here in case I haven't made it clear or lest it seem I'm not giving credit where credit is due, but when we talk about technological achievements and innovation, we often do so in a nationalistic manner. A and with good reason, we should be proud of our achievements as Americans. But when you look at the ocean, do you see a borderline? I've looked, I've looked and I've yet to see one. I've traveled to Europe extensively throughout my career to learn their innovations and to show them mine. And I've worked with people of many different nationalities, many different tongues, and I found that water is water, no matter whether it borders Detroit, Toronto, New York, London, Stockholm, or St. Petersburg. Does Russian or Finnish ice care that the ship trying to break it was designed by a boy from Cleveland? No more than the water in Cleveland cares that it is being moved by feathered paddles designed in Europe. Yes, technological innovation and cooperation is good for business. And yes, I have received commissions from foreign governments, but it also serves as a reminder to me that there are some experiences we all share. That said, let me tell you about another successful collaboration I had. It might surprise you to hear this, but even someone who designs boats can 
make money by partnering with the railways. In the 90s, I designed, I designed propeller-driven rail car ferries to help the railroads transport their rail cars across the water, the Great Lakes, of course. Now, that icebreaker, the St. Ignace, was one such ship, although it didn't hold nearly enough cars. So, Boynton and I collaborated yet again on another larger ship, the St. Marie. Excuse me. I just had an idea here. So, if we could transport rail cars, I say, why not even automobiles? Or, how about aeroplanes? No, no, I, that would never work. <laughs> that would never. Now, it just goes to show that even I have the occasional ridiculous idea. So, I have a good job, that's true. <laughs> I a little trouble there. I have a good job. I can say I'm proud of my work, but it's rare that anyone asks about the people, the men and women I've had in my employ over the years. <laughs> the ones in the shipyard who build the hulls, the carpenters who whistle, the pattern makers, the machinists and riveters with the metal shavings in their cuffs, the molders and core makers with sand and clay under their fingernails, and of course, <laughs> The welders, the welders who sing hymns incessantly into the echo chambers of their mask behind the acetylene flame. From those in their teen years to those in old age, I have known many and I have seen many acts of strength, skill, and ingenuity. I remember once, while on a jaunt at the engine works, coming across a, man, a young man enjoying a moment of carefree tranquility. I couldn't help but smile, thinking of all the times Fritz and I had done the same at Ward Shipyard. He looked tired, to be fair, and I could tell he had been hard at work only moments before. <laughs> That's right, I said. Just sit there and smile at me. Make no pretense, simply because I'm the boss. I nodded at a group of his equally exhausted comrades who were trying their best at deception. I'd rather do you do that than pretend to be working as they are simply because the boss happens to be walking by. I gave him a wink and asked for his name. Ford, sir. Henry Ford. <laughs> well, he's made quite a career for himself since then. But not all the memories are fond, if I'm being honest. There are realities to shipyards that many wouldn't know. Disputes, disagreements. I'm an architect, but I'm also a capitalist. I employ people for their labor and skill. I do not shirk from my duty, nor do I tolerate those who would, those who would halt production of work with a stoppage. I recall a particular dispute with the riveters at the Detroit Dry Dock Company. I posted a note as followed. To all workmen, including riveters, the habit of losing time, especially on Mondays, will not be permitted hereafter. The timekeeper has been instructed to note all those not on regular working hours. Any workman employed by this yard who cannot work steadily each whole working day need not work at all. As a follow-up response, I introduced pneumatic riveting to the DDD. It cut costs and allowed us to hire unskilled workers to operate the machines. In the 90s, my reputation was spreading. And when my country called on me to outfit transports for the Spanish-American War, I put all my other work aside, including a river hull steamer I was working on for the White Star Line, and I answered the call. But at what cost? The Detroit Dry Dock Company, the company that had been my home for decades and the company my father had helped form, was purchased by the American Shipbuilding Company, which along with its associated yards on the riverfront became the Detroit Shipbuilding Company. The Detroit Dry Dock Company had been my home for many decades, and now that home was no more. I felt the bearing of weight, of responsibility on my shoulders, in part because of the perceived missteps of the business, but also because I let it distract me from my real work. What I do know is that I didn't let it slow me down. I instead used that weight to propel me forward. That river hole steamer I'd left unfinished, well, she'd soon be put to good use. 
June 4th, 1901, was a day of excitement I will always remember. <laughs> a great steamship race on the lakes from Cleveland to Erie, Pennsylvania, a distance of some 94 miles. The Tashmu of the White Star Line and the city of Erie of the Cleveland and Buffalo Transit Company. Now, before we get to the race, let me set the scene. In 1900, after another different race on Lake Michigan, an overly credulous reporter who witnessed the event remarked that the winner was the fastest ship on the Great Lakes. Now, this type of hyperbole wasn't uncommon at the time in regards to ships, but that didn't sit any better back in Detroit, where it was said that at least nine ships were faster. Now, someone who took notice was A.A. A. Parker, president of the White Star Line and owner of the Tashmu, which in its short life had already earned the nickname of White Flyer because of her speed. Now, Parker bet $1,000 to anyone who could beat the Tashmu in a race. And as you can imagine, it didn't take long before someone spoke up accepting the bet. T.F. Newman, president of the Cleveland and Buffalo Transit Company, took the bet because he felt his ship, the city of Erie, was faster and could give the Tashmu a real run for her money. So, there we were. Oh, June 4th, 1901, and the two contenders ready to begin. It was said that over $100,000 was wagered on this race. Now, who here would place their bet on my ship? Come now, let's see a show of hands. Ah, yes, that was a very wise bet. I designed both ships. It was said that over 20,000 people had turned out to watch the start of the race in Cleveland, and many more were waiting to bear witness in Pennsylvania and in ships anchored all along the route. The shot indicating the start of the race rang out at 918, and the race was on. The city of Erie got off to the faster start of the two, and by the time they were three miles into the race, the Tashmu lagged behind. But in the span of 15 minutes' time, the city of Erie, excuse me, the Tashmu passed the city of Erie and built a considerable lead. But this is where the Tashmu had cause for concern. The city of Erie was running one of its usual routes, and the Tashmu, which normally made the run from Port Huron to Detroit, was in relatively uncharted waters, as it were. And as the shoreline disappeared, so too did the Tashmu's lead. It was said that the wheelman of the Tashmu wasn't used to navigating by compass, and this caused some poor steering on his part, which slowed the ship. Then a condenser overheated, which slowed the ship even further. Now, the race lasted for more than four hours, mostly out of the eyes of spectators. But when the crew of the Tashmu spotted the shoreline, the wheelman took off and closed the distance in a hurry. But in the end, it couldn't make up for lost time, and the city of Erie beat it by 45 seconds. The Detroit Free Press called the race the greatest steamboat contest in history. But that the close finish shows little contest between the two freshwater greyhounds. And that, my friends, is how I won and lost such an amazing race. Sometimes I wonder if, on one of those spectating ships, a stealthy boy with splinters in his hands watched through a porthole with electricity in his eyes. There was, however, a longing in me for the, for the familiar, perhaps a longing. Without DDD, Detroit felt different to me. Some time had passed, it was 1906. I moved to New York City. I'd visit Detroit now and then, and I'd stay at the Cadillac Hotel when I did. I also kept a small office, which I only allowed a few people the knowledge of. In fact, it... Huh. Well, would you look at that? Ladies and gentlemen, I, I did say that sometimes this trip goes a little faster than one imagines, and people often wish for more time. And, well, today it seems that person is me. Perhaps next time I'll tell you about how I introduced electric lighting onto my ships, or my adventures with Teddy Roosevelt, or even how I worked on a large commission during the Great War with none other than that tired boy from my shipyard, Mr. Henry Ford. <laughs> it is fun to look back sometimes and take stock of one's achievements. At this time, I've designed close to 100 ships, and ah, I could rattle on forever. I could. These ideas will help me with the design of my next ship. Thank you for your time. 
DNC had a very good year last year, and they've, they've asked me to come up with something dazzling, a majestic Leviathan. I have to say, my mind is really heating up with ideas, and I'm looking for inspiration everywhere. I'm trying to come up with a name right now. This, this ship will serve the people of Detroit for many years to come, and I want it to be something grand, something great. Oh, <laughs> sometimes the best answer is the obvious one. The Greater Detroit. I'll have to write that down so I remember. Oh, well, speaking of remembering, I hope you all have a day to remember. I hope you'll forgive me rushing off like this, but I do have some things I'd like to speak to the captain about. Uh, perhaps I'll see you on the dance, on the dance floor near the picnic grounds. But anyhow, I could tell stories all day, but. I just simply don't have the time. Thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful to meet you all. Until next time.